All right, well, I'm Fred Edwards again. I guess you might remember me from the lunch. Um, I'm National Director of the United Coalition of Reason, but that isn't the hat I'm wearing right now. I'm wearing my American Humanist Association hat uh, because I'm the guy who thought that maybe we should bring dancing Matt Harding to this conference. And let me tell you how that happened. I goof around on the internet a little bit, like a lot of us do, and I watch some of those viral videos, as some of you do, and I stumbled upon a video of this goofy-looking guy dancing in front of monuments all over the world, and I thought, what an interesting, goofy idea. Uh, and it was kind of funny. And then he started dancing with other people from all over the world. And it was more than just funny and goofy, it brought tears to my eyes. And I thought, this is just fabulous. What is this guy's game? What's his angle? Well, he had a website, and he had a, he had a little note on his website saying something to the effect of, oh, and if you happen to want to know what my personal philosophy is, I think you'll find it here. And he had a link to the Wikipedia article on humanism. And I thought, whoa! This guy's one of us! Whoa! A guy with a viral video doing all of this neat stuff all over the world, and he's one of us. Whoopee! <laughs> Let's get him to the American Humanist Association Conference. So, I talked to Roy Speckhart, and I talked to Maggie Ardiente, and I said, really, you've got to get this guy. And, uh, they, you know, and, and they weren't so sure. And I said, watch the video, watch the video. And they watched the video, and all right, San Diego, that's going to be the place. We're going to have Dancing Matt Harding right here in San Diego. And I says, and he, we got to do a video shoot. We got to get everyone out there dancing. We all want to be in that video. All of us, humanists, we want to be part of this global phenomenon. And so with that introduction, I think I need say nothing more. Here we are with Dancing Matt Harding. Uh, first, I want to say to anyone with a feeling of dread welling up inside them right now, that dancing is optional. You don't have to dance. I don't make anyone dance. Um, but yeah, we'll do that at the end. Um, OK, so uh -oh, what's going on here? Hmm. It was working before. Oh, it's sidling through. Okay. S video. Computer one. There we go. Hi. Um, I am Matt, uh, and I have a logo. That's, that's my logo. <laughs> This is uh, all the places I've danced in the last 10 or so years. Um, I've never gotten applause for that before. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe you're looking at that and going, wow, that's a whole lot of places. Or if you're like me, you're looking at that map and saying, look at all those enormous gaps. Look at those huge holes where Matt has never gotten to and never danced. And, uh, all I can say to that is that there are very good reasons why I haven't yet gotten to <laughs> the handful of spots. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the first dancing clip I ever filmed uh, in 2003. Uh, so that's coming up uh, as of tomorrow, June of 2003. It'll be 10 years ago, uh, just about tomorrow. Uh, I had. <clears throat> Let's see, where to start on this one. I when, I when I grew up, all I really wanted to do with my life was make and play video games. I was pretty sure at a pretty young age that I knew where I was headed. And, um, and I was fortunate enough that I got to start doing that very young. Uh, I start to, started working as a video game designer when I was 19 in Los Angeles. Young enough that I was able to have my midlife crisis at 26. Um, <laughs> when I realized that uh, the world was a lot bigger than I thought it was when I was a kid. And the things that I thought I wanted to do with my life when I was a teenager maybe weren't the things that I really wanted to do with my life. Uh, I uh, got to work as a game designer down in Australia. And in Australia, when you go traveling, you don't take your 
10 days paid vacation that you get for the year and go to Disney World. Australians go and they, they take all the money that they've, they've gathered and they say, all right, bye mom, bye dad, I'm gonna go wander the planet for a couple of years. Um, and I had a bunch of friends who did that in Australia and that really appealed to me. So when I hit this moment where I realized that I didn't wanna sit in front of a computer screen all day, every day for the rest of my life, um, I didn't know what I did wanna do, so I, I did some traveling. I took the money that I'd saved up at my job and I went wandering around the planet. So here we are in June of 2003. Uh, I'm unemployed and having a wonderful time. I'd realized by this point that travel was the thing that I loved, um, but I hadn't figured out how I was gonna get to keep on doing it because there's not a lot of jobs where you get to just wander the planet. Um, but then I had this really fortunate serendipitous moment which was when my friend Brad, who took over my job, uh, said, hey, why don't you go stand over there on the curb and do that stupid dance you do? Now, he, I, had a, I had a digital camera in my pocket. How many of you right now have something in your pocket that can shoot video? Raise your hand. All right. If you can recall, how many of you had something in your pocket 10 years ago that could shoot video? One, two, and me. I had just bought this digital camera. They were brand new. They'd just come on the market and you could flick the dial over to video and record yourself. You didn't have to carry around a big, clunky video camera. So uh, we, were, we were taking pictures in Hanoi, Vietnam, and he said, go stand over there in front of all the motorbikes and do that stupid dance you do. And I was able to record it. Now, I got to be the first guy to do a stupid dance in an exotic place. I assure you, the guy in this image does not realize that he stumbled across a million dollar idea that is gonna change his life in profound ways. Uh, but it did. I got to be the first guy who did this. Um, and when I kept on traveling, every place I'd, I'd go to, until, until the money ran out, I would stand in front of an interesting landmark and do that dance. Two years later, uh, I found that video that I made on a website called YouTube. Uh, this was 2005 now. I'd never heard of YouTube before. It had just been founded uh, that year. And somebody had uploaded my video to it, and it had gotten 600,000 views. Uh, the funny thing about that was it had been uploaded, uploaded by somebody who wrote in the comments that they, that they were me, and they would created a PayPal account, matt.harding at paypal.com, and they were asking people to donate money uh, so he could keep on traveling and making these videos. <laughs> Um, I tracked him down and I said, I don't know who you are, but you're not me. Uh, could you knock it off? And he wrote back to me and he said he collected $235 in donations and he'd be willing to cut me in on 5% of it. <laughs> he was, a, he was a, I think, a 16-year-old kid who was very entrepreneurial, much more than I am. Um, and, but I, I owe him huge gratitude because he got this thing out for me. And, uh, and I thought, when I, when I realized 600,000 people had just watched this video, I wanted to curl up in a ball and hide under my bed until it all went away. Uh, uh, we, question? Where did you find it? Oh, I had it on my website. I had, it, I had a QuickTime MOV file buried on my website that he downloaded and posted. Uh, nobody was watching it there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, I, I thought it was going to be really embarrassing. I thought people were going to make fun of me. Uh, but people saw this video and it expressed something that I, I guess a lot of people felt. It expressed this feeling of joy that goes along with travel. It's, it's maybe how they feel when they travel. It's maybe how they want to feel when they travel. But people found uh, profound meaning in a video that honestly was just me going like this. Oh gosh. Um, so I didn't know what was going on, but I, I knew a good thing when I saw it. And um, I started getting floods of email. You've all heard this story about things taking off on the internet. Um, I got all these people reaching out to me, and one of the people who reached out to me worked for a company called Stride Gum, and they said, we're launching this new gum in 2006. Would you make another one of your videos for us? And I said, well, will you pay for it? And they said, yes. And I said, then sure. Um, 2006, I took off on a six month round the world trip. I went to all seven continents, 39 countries, um, to make uh, my second Where the Hell is Matt dancing video. Uh, at the time, the idea was, holy crap, these people are going to pay me to travel. I'm gonna have the time of my life, and I did. Um, but 
the idea was just to go to postcard landmarks, what you expect to see in Egypt, what you expect to see in India, the Taj Mahal, Great Wall of China, and I was going to do my dance in front of them, which isn't saying much more than a dog says when you take him for a walk and he goes and pees on a bush or a fire hydrant or a mailbox. He's saying, I was here. Um, and I hadn't put too much more thought into it than that. It was, I was going to get to travel, so that's what I was going to do. I was going to tell people, I went here, I went here, and I did my dance. But a really, really fortunate thing happened to me again uh, on this trip. I went to Rwanda. Um, I wanted to include Africa in the video. I didn't have many specific uh, clips in mind there, but I did know someone who was working for an NGO in Rwanda. And I went and met up with him. Now, Rwanda, there aren't a lot of places, there aren't a lot of postcard locations in Rwanda that you would want to dance in front of. Um, what there is, a lot of, is people. Uh, Rwanda is one of the most densely populated countries in Africa. So when I was there, instead of finding some uh, monument or something to dance in front of, I went to a village uh, called Mulindi and found a bunch of kids who were playing next to a puddle. And I went up to them. I didn't speak any Kenya Rwandan. I didn't speak any French. They didn't speak any English. It didn't matter. I started dancing. They started dancing too. Um, this is it. And, uh, and that turned out to be, out of that whole round the world trip, um, the best experience I had, the best clip in the video, and uh, a, I had a, a very energy efficient epiphany in that moment, uh, which is that um, me dancing by myself is not actually that interesting. I wish it was, but it's not. Uh, me dancing with other people, different people in each place, uh, seeing them do the same thing or different things, whatever, is really, really interesting because dance transcends language and it breaks down barriers and the silliness of just flailing your limbs around is a tool for seeing people for who they are. Um, this is something it took me a long time to figure out but uh, I, I discovered it there in Rwanda and uh, another thing I realized is that I'm not a very good dancer. Uh, I don't know if, have, you, have you guys seen the video? Raise your hand if you've seen one of my videos. Okay. Maybe half of you guys. All right, so you, if you've seen one of these videos, you know I'm not a very good dancer, but that's okay. My weakness was a strength. If you saw that guy on the left dancing on the street, the first thing you might think is, I thought he was dead. The second thing you would <laughs> think is, I'm going to enjoy watching that guy dance. I am not going to go and dance with him. But by dancing the way that I dance, I set the barrier for entry really, really low. You're thinking, I am not going to dance worse than that guy. So. It, it was a very inclusive thing. Um, so after realizing these two things, I put the video up on YouTube that I'd made, and it did really well. 10 million people watched it. Um, and so Stride was very happy with how it turned out, and I was able to go back to them and say, thank you so much for sending me around the world. I had a great time, but I did it wrong. You need to send me around the world again. And this time, I'm gonna get people to come out and dance with me. And they said, okay. Uh, so they gave me another two years to make the 2008 video, um, which I'm not going to make you sit through, uh, but here's a little collage of it. Um, if you've seen one of my videos, you've probably seen this one. It's currently at about 45 million views on YouTube. Um, and this was, it took me five years to get to the point where I made this video, and this was the, the one where I felt like I finally got it right. Um, it's, it's just me for a little bit of it, but, but there's thousands of other people joining in in all these different places, um, and it really changed my life. This was the third video. Each one was a little bit bigger, but this third one really, really changed my life, and I'll tell you a little bit about how it changed my life. One way is I became the king of all mats on Google. If you pull out your phone right now and you type in M-A-T-T, -T, the first thing that's gonna come up is my website, my dancing video. Um, eventually, if you go down far enough, you'll get to, there's Matt Mullenweg, uh, who created the WordPress blog, and he cleverly embedded his name in the meta tags for every WordPress blog. So he, for a while, was the number one Matt on Google. And he, I learned he actually had business cards that said the number one Matt on Google until I ruined that. Um, I met him at a conference once, and we're, we're not close. Uh, <laughs> Next Matt down, I also met at a conference. At the time, he was number eight. He came up to me and said, you're Matt number one. I said, yes. He said, I'm Matt number eight. But Matt is now number three. So 
in the battle of mats on Google. Uh, this, is the, this is the top rank. I don't know why I'm number one. Somebody up there at Google likes me. Um, but <laughs> another thing that changed is um, these folks at Visa came along. And they said, we really enjoyed your video. And uh, we've done some focus testing with it. And we found that it makes people very, very happy. And we would like to make people very, very happy. So would you do an ad campaign across Asia uh, doing your dance for us? And that was an interesting question and one that I really struggled with. Do I want to turn these, this project of mine, these videos I've been making, into TV commercials for credit cards? Um, and I kind of agonized over that. And I, I talked to my partner, Melissa, about it. And she uh, gave me some very wise advice. She said, yes. <laughs> you're going to do that. So I did. And she was right. Uh, and that was five years ago. And I've been, I've been working for them uh, off and on ever since. In fact, I just flew here from India, where I finished filming another um, commercial for them that took two weeks to shoot. So um, that has been a very, very good thing for me and took care of the whole money issue. A lot of people wonder, you know, how do you make money? off of YouTube and all that. Well, that's a very complicated answer, but this is the really simple, this is the really simple one, which is Visa comes along and, uh, and takes care of money for you. So uh, I was able to do, after that, I was able to do whatever I wanted. But what I wanted was to start a family. So Melissa and I, we got a house, and we had our son. Um, and I didn't have to work uh, for a while. So I got to stay home and um, raise our son. But I did have this thing nagging me in the back of my head, which was something left unsaid by the last video. Um, when I made the video, I had to sign a contract um, that said that I would not go to a short list of countries. There were a few countries in this world that I could not include in the video. You can probably guess what a lot of those countries are. I couldn't go to Iran. I couldn't go to Iraq. I couldn't go to North Korea. I couldn't go to, I think, Lebanon, Afghanistan. Um, sorry? Cuba, I could not go to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, so that, that bugged me, because the more that I traveled making these videos, the more I realized um, this thing that I keep forgetting and then relearning over and over again. Uh, and actually, I'll show you some pictures, because the place where I learned it best, and the place I think about often, is Yemen. Um, I went to Yemen in 2008. Yemen has been called one of the most dangerous places in the world. That doesn't mean it is. It just means someone called it that. Um, but we, uh, we send drone strikes, up until fairly recently, we've sent dro drone strikes into Yemen on an almost daily basis. It's one of the handful of places in this world um, that is pretty much lawless outside of the cities. Um, Al-Qaeda is very active there. Um, there are a lot of scary things about Yemen. But I went there by myself in 2008 uh, to see what it would be like. And I didn't have any contact there. I didn't have any plan. I was just hoping to wander around until I found some people who would dance with me and then set up my camera and film it. This is Mujahad. Mujahad uh, I hired to take me out into the uh, countryside of Yemen. And aside from the fact that his name terrified me, he also had a huge dagger in his belt, which <laughs> terrified me a great deal. But he told me not to worry. Everything would be fine. Uh, actually, the morning that uh, I, after I arrived, the morning that Mujahad and I took this drive, uh, I checked the news to find that uh, an al-Qaeda cell in the town that I was in, in the city, Sana'a, had fired a, a rocket-propelled grenade at a US oil company there. Um, and they were evacuating all embassy personnel and advising everybody with US citizenship to get out of the country. Um, so it was pretty scary. And the only reason that I went with Mujahad into the countryside is because I was there by myself, and there was no one with me to tell me what an idiot I was being. Um, but I went, and here's what I saw. Um, kids smiling all over the place, lots of them. Uh, and uh, I, so I, I, I had a wonderful time. People were friendly and welcoming. They knew that I was an American. That didn't matter. Um, they came up and shook my hand. And 
I'm sure that there were people in those places who were, whose actions were driven by fear and ignorance and hatred, but I didn't see that. I saw far, far more people who were playful and happy and wanted to live peaceful lives. And I realized this thing that I keep forgetting and learning over and over again, which is that there are so many more of those people everywhere you go, everywhere, even the places that are the most, considered the most dangerous, the most frightening, there are more people who um, want to live happy, peaceful lives. This picture uh, doesn't reinforce that point. I just put it in there because I love it. We were driving through the countryside and um, this guy's truck, he had driven off a cliff. So here, this truck here is poised on the, teetering on the edge of a cliff and he has gotten out of his truck and is sitting in the shade waiting for his circumstances to change. <laughs> I left it in because it seemed maybe at a humanist conference it might be somehow appropriate. I don't know how exactly. Um, but if you figure it out, please come up and explain it to me. Um, so I wanted to make another video uh, that expressed this thing that I learned, that the world is safer and more open than it's ever been. The data tells us this. There's less crime, there's less murder, there's less war, there's more equality, there's more access to education, there's more civil liberties than there's ever been before. And if you're thinking about all the terrible things going on in the world that contradict this, good. Because you know what, nobody used to care about those things anymore. Nobody was worrying about all the terrible things going on in the world like we are now. The world is getting better, but we turn on the TV and this is not what we see. We if you ask most people, is the world getting safer, they will tell you no. Um, but the data tells us it is. The data, unfortunately, doesn't matter to us that much because we're not robots. We're emotional beings. And um, emotionally, we are, you know, we're driven by fear and we tend to see the world getting worse. So I have this video, this thing that I stumbled onto, where I dance like this. And it is a tool um, for creating emotional understanding. People watch other people dancing and being silly together and, it, and, it, and you, you understand this thing emotionally uh, rather than intellectually. Um, and so I wanted to use this video uh, to help express that point. Now, here's the thing that I strongly believe. If you're making an internet video on YouTube, the last thing you want to do is have a point. Um, it is the death of a YouTube video to have a point and to have a message. And I do believe this, I, but I am getting up there in years as YouTube stars go. And as I said, I'd become a father. And if I was going to make another YouTube video, uh, it needed, if I was going to spend two years of my life staying in crappy hotels and sitting in airport terminals, um, it needed to have a point. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to say, that we don't need to be afraid of each other. We may have lots of good reasons to be afraid of each other, but we can make the choice not to have our actions driven by fear. And when we make that choice, we break a cycle that's been going on for a very long time. Um, I, wanna sh I wanna tell you a story. I'm gonna show you the video, uh, but I wanna tell you a story first uh, about this shot. This is in Pyongyang, North Korea. I shot this in 2011 on dear leader Kim Jong-il's, what turned out to be his final birthday. He died at the end of that year. Um, I went to North Korea for his birthday celebration because I knew, I knew they'd do a mass dance. Um, and I was going to try and get some people to dance with me during the mass dance. Now you can, first thing, a lot of people ask me this, yes, you can go to North Korea. Anyone in this room can go to North Korea. They're happy to have you. You can even go right now in the middle of the turmoil that's going on there. They do accept tourists. They accept US tourists. Um, and it's perfectly safe. But your interactions with North Koreans is very, very limited. When you go into North Korea, you stay at the hotel in North Korea. And it's on an island. And you're not allowed to leave it uh, when you're not on a tour, tour bus. And you have North Korean guides who are with you the whole time. Uh, and they'll let you know when you can take a picture. And they'll let you know where you can go and where you can't go. Um, and they're job is to make sure you don't have too much interaction with the regular North Korean citizens. 
But I went there to shoot this video and I explained it to the tour company. I'm going to shoot a Where the Hell is Matt video clip in North Korea. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. I talked to the North Korean guys. I said on the mass dance celebration, I would like to um, dance with some North Koreans. Is that okay? And they said, ha, 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 yes, 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 yes. Now here's what I learned later. When a North Korean laughs at you, it's not because he thinks what you're saying is funny. It's because you're making him very uncomfortable. Um, that's what laughter means with a North Korean. So I was making this guy very, very uncomfortable, and he was saying the most, the easiest response that he could have, which was, yes, 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 sure, whatever. No way in hell are you going to dance with them. Um, so uh, this was the mass dance. Uh, we watched them all dancing out there in the park. We were able to stand by the side. Uh, we were not... To, we had some limited participation that we could do, but I wasn't able to film a clip. Uh, and I kept saying to the guy, as soon as this is over, I'm going to be able to film a clip, right? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, the dance ended. Uh, all the dancers started moving off to the side. Uh, they started moving toward their buses. They took our, my tour group and they started sh pushing us toward the bus. And I panicked. Oh my God. Uh, I, I'm going to shoot the clip, right? And they said, yes, 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 get on the bus. And, uh, and I was really upset because I'd come here for this specific purpose and here it was passing me by. And this was one of the most important clips that I wanted to put in the video, if not the most important clip, was to include North Korea and be dancing with North Koreans. And the moment was disappearing. So I looked over at the British tour guide who came with us, Simon, and I had this you know, puppy dog look on my face as this opportunity was disappearing. And he looked back at me and he said, go. Uh, so. <laughs> So I didn't think, which is something I'm very good at, and I grabbed my tripod and camera and I ran across the park into this crowd. Uh, I plopped the camera down, I hit record, and I started dancing. I started doing the dance, their dance, that I'd watched them perform, I'd learned it. And it was this, sort of this kind of a thing and this kind of a thing. And as soon as I started doing it, there, believe me, there were security guards everywhere. There was a, a significant armed presence standing right there. But as soon as I started doing this dance, they were in stitches. This whole crowd here was laughing their asses off. And it wasn't uncomfortable laughter. They were genuinely in stitches at this gigantic American white person who was doing their dance. Um, and I didn't know what else to do, so I just kept on, I just looped it. I just kept on doing that dance over and over again. Yeah. No, I didn't have music going. Uh, I was just standing there doing their dance to no music while they laughed. And I realized that I was in a stalemate. As long as I was doing the dance, the security wasn't going to come in and stop me because there was too much attention on it. Um, but I didn't have a clip because nobody was dancing with me. I was just dancing by myself. And I kept looking over at the crowd and say, come on, dance with me, dance with me. And they'd say, no, we're not going to dance with you. Um, and then the, this amazing thing happened. This woman that you see right here on the right stepped out of the crowd and she bowed to me and then we started dancing together. Now, uh, I probably don't need to tell you this, but every North Korean citizen is taught from birth that Americans are poised all around their country, have always been, waiting to invade, and that we are terrifying. Um, the other thing that North Koreans are taught from birth is do not ever do anything to stick your neck out. Do not get noticed. And here we are in this moment, this woman has stepped out of the crowd, just her and no one else, faced what she knows to be an American, and she's dancing with me in front of everybody. I have never seen a greater example of courage in my life, and I never, I don't think I ever will. If you want an example of courage in this world, think of this woman uh, and what she did in these five or ten seconds when she chose to dance with me. So I'm going to show you the video in a minute. Uh, and this is going to be five seconds of the video. It's going to pass right by. But I want you to know that story because that's the whole point. That's what I'm doing. She did it right there. Uh, okay, another question. Yeah. She knew. <laughs> there were, no, um, pretty sure she knew. Um, some, there, was, there, was a, there were some Brits in our group, a couple Spaniards. Most of us were American. I, don't, I can't explain to you why, but um, I'm pretty sure she knew. And, and if I was 
British instead of American or Australian, it wouldn't really matter that much anyway. <laughs> to my initial point, yeah. The, um, okay, so I'm going to show you the video and then we're going to dance. And after we dance, if you want to come up and just ask for a one-on-one -on -one dance with me, absolutely, yes. Can you record it? Yes, sure. Just come and grab me. I'll be here for a little while. Uh, but first, I'm going to put on the video and I hope you guys enjoy it.
So we're going to dance n pretty soon, but I think there's one or two questions. Did you have a question? <laughs> um, you mentioned that you stay in crappy hotels on the trip. Um, I'm with a UN affiliated organization called Serva that has hosts in 130 countries around the world. And all of us are invited to stay with local hosts when we travel. So being on that board, I'd like to personally invite you to consider learning about Serva. Thank you very much. Right, I think we got a little bit of time for a couple questions. Yes. Uh, wait. Uh, yes. It, with the beard and the cane. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you step up to the mic? I like your stuff. Thanks. But uh, I have a criticism. Okay. And I, I, this is difficult because I'm sure I'm not going to win a lot of friends criticizing this. Uh, what you're doing is showing like the human spirit, and that's wonderful. That part's wonderful. But uh, my criticism is that y that when you accepted the corporate sponsorship, uh, it, it gives me a lot of mixed feelings because uh, while they allow you to do this, what they're doing is in a sense usurping this uh, human spirit, and, and in a sense trying to buy off their exploitation of the world and the market. And I'm wondering what, how you feel about that, because on the one hand, what you're doing is so positive, but the fact that it's being usurped in a way to sell products, to me, is it, it, something that's almost blas blasphemous. So, I mean, this is a honest well, The video question. that you just watched wasn't sponsored by anybody. I paid for it out of pocket. Um, and I w <laughs> now I, I would have <laughs> I paid for it out of pocket because I couldn't find anybody who was going to sponsor me to go to North Korea and Afghanistan um, I wouldn't be able to do what I did without the help of the companies that pay for it if it wasn't for that these just wouldn't exist I wouldn't be able to go to the places so um, I make a living from doing this and I take the living that I make from it and I'm able to make the videos that I want to make. Um, that's how I make it work for me and I feel really, really, really good about it and not at all conflicted. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I welcome the critique. It, it, it is a valid one. That's how I make it work for me is I make that video. Uh, yes, in back there, yeah? Hi, Matt. This is Manuel. Uh, I was glad to really see Medellin, Colombia there. Oh, yeah. was, I'm from Colombia originally. It's a country that loves to dance. We have many types of dancing. Uh, cumbia, one of them. Um, very inspiring. Uh, brings us back to that we are all one family, one people. Uh, as Carl Kuhn, uh, who wrote the wonderful book, Carl Kuhn said, one family, one planet. Um, my question has to do with, I also do work with dialogues with uh, people in conflict, and what the possibility that I see here is what if you were dancing, let's say, the Palestinians and the Israelis. I had a, I worked with them 10 years ago, and we were able to dance a little bit. Uh, it's just a question. The possibility of getting people that are in conflict to dance. So there were Palestinians dancing in that video, and there were Israelis. Um, the trick is getting them to dance together at right. the same time. And the magic of this video is that I don't have to solve that problem. I can use the power of editing to uh, dance with them at different times in different places and then put them next to each other. Um, yes, I've thought about that. Uh, creatively, I worry that it would be a little too on the nose, a little heavy handed. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to ride the line, you know, go shoot past the line of, 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 of you know, pushing it down people's throats, the message. You know thank what I mean? You. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. 
Um, uh, did you have a question, sir, right by the microphone? Be a quick one. No, I just had a comment on the previous, previous to previous comment, saying that there's nothing wrong in having commercial video. You are, um, the company needed advertising, and you were one of the, the vehicles by which they advertised, and you raised money that way. Mm. And then you did these videos with the, without any sponsorship, and I think I see absolutely no conflict in that at all. Yeah, I, I think the conflict does get, is created when the question of control comes up. Um, because, as I mentioned, when I did have the sponsors, they gave me a list of countries I couldn't go to. And that uh, rubbed me the wrong way, as I said. And so I was, I was able to make my own video. So I can go and I can make corporate videos where they have the final say, as, and then I'm able to, because of that, make my own videos. And yeah. Um, OK, I, I still see a couple more hands going up. And I don't know how much time we have. And I do want to do some dancing. Uh, <laughs> Okay, you, you're up in the microphone, yeah? Has the State Department had any feedback or exchange with you? Have yeah, you heard I've heard from, from some them? people in the State Department, someone, I can't remember her title, who's a, a big fan of the video and talked to me about you know, going as an ambassador for the State Department, but it's not really, I, yeah, I, don't know what, I don't know how that would work or what the point would be. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of, I, I try not to make these videos as an American. I try to make them as a global citizen. Um, so being of a particular country, I, I, I mean, I, I choose not to go that route. But, you know, I'm open to possibilities, too. Um, so who knows? Um, I, we do, I do have to wrap it up um, because I want to do some dancing. Who, who wants to dance? All right. If you don't want to dance, as I said at the beginning, that's just fine. By the way, if you have a question, so you can come up to me afterwards. Uh, if you don't want to dance, here's how we sh we're going to do this. Um, that area over there is going to kind of be off camera, because the camera's are over there. And this central area, particularly the aisles, are going to be on camera. So if you want to join me, I'm going to stand by that microphone in the aisle right there. Um, if you want to stand where you are here in front of your seat, that's great. And we're going to do the dance. It's going to take about 15 seconds, and then we're done. show you how to do it. Here's a quick dance tutorial, okay? First thing now is you can't do it wrong, okay? Whatever your body does not know, that's the right way to do it. I'll show you how I do it. I step like this, left, right, left, right. Swing my elbows back and forward. The most important thing, big goofy smile. All right? Fantastic. Okay. We're going to do it in one take, and then when we finish, you're going to hear me count down three, two, one, and then I want to see Jazz hands, that's the big finish, okay? Is the camera ready to go? Any way you want, just fling your hands out and jazz hands. All right, are we ready? You rolling? I'm gonna... camera anyway.